Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Welcome to Sheikh Uthameen's tafsir of Surat al-Baqarah in the English language, and this is part 3. I would like to remind you again that the PowerPoint slides are available in the video description for you to download and to look at and keep for your future reference. One thing I would suggest, perhaps, that uh, before watching these uh, videos, it might be a good idea for you to take a quick glance at the PowerPoints first, just to get a brief idea of what's coming up, and then, inshallah, you can listen to the lecture afterwards, and this way, hopefully, you can get a more wholesome, uh, you know, lesson as we go through this. So, to moving on with the same verse that we left off with last time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is speaking about an analogy. Last time, we talked about how there was a fire analogy, an analogy of fire, and an analogy of water. Uh, this one is the one that is the analogy of water that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing the hypocrites in those in those terms. So we left off last time talking about this analogy. We said that it applies to hypocrites who have not tasted faith to begin with, meaning they never believed inherently. This is in reference to the hypocrites from the Jews. Uh, the Jews never tasted Islam ever. They are disbelievers from the outset, but they pretended to be Muslims out of fear of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after he was victorious at the Battle of Badr. However, these Jews were already in darkness from the beginning, so they never even became Muslim uh, and then left Islam after that and became hypocrites. Uh, otherwise, you have the Arab hypocrites from the tribes of the Aus and the Khazraj. Um, those ones are like the first analogy of fire because we were talking about kindling a fire and how there was a, a fire that lighted up just around a person as an analogy uh, to show that there was a bit of faith, but then it just... Didn't, didn't last. But this one here, they're already working, walking in darkness, you know, rain and and uh, darkness of the rain, the clouds, the night, and so on, and then the lightning coming, and they can't handle it, and they cover their eyes, um, and they they also close their ears from hearing the thunderclaps and so on, because they can't take the truth, and they're scared of anything that comes near them. So we, we were basically saying that the two analogies are different, uh, and munafiqun, hypocrites, are different types. And the Jews never entered Islam to begin with. So the one who never entered Islam to begin with and pretended to be Muslim, or pretended to be Muslims, um, are explained by the analogy of the rainstorm. The thunderclaps are signs of warning and fear. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the hypocrites, يَحْسَبُونَ كُلَّ صَيْحَةٍ عَلَيْهِمْ They think that every shout is against them. And this is something we have to be careful about. Not to always think, oh, I'm paranoid and everyone's out to get me. This is an attribute of the munafiqun. Uh, the lightning uh, symbolizes the light of Islam. But in this case, this light is not everlasting. Lightning comes and goes quickly, as we know. The hypocrites only benefit from it for a split second to move forward very slightly. Right? As the verse says, As soon as it becomes dark, they stop. And this light almost blinds them because they're not able to benefit from this light which the Messenger of Allah uh, وسلم, brought. All of this is due to their own arrogance, meaning the Jews, and their envy of the Arabs. So, to summarize, the, the analogy of fire is not like the analogy of water that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used. Some scholars have said that they're the same thing. Others, like Shaykh Hathameen, said no, they are different because the analogy of fire means that this person became Muslim in the beginning, but his, his faith was shaky and it didn't last, and he left Islam, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically sealed their hearts as a result of seeing the truth and rejecting it and not you know giving it its true value so the first type that was described by the kindling of the fire is the type that had faith in the beginning allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says on the right side of the screen there that is because they believed they first believed right and then they disbelieved so their hearts were sealed over and they do not understand Imagine being sealed from understanding. <clears throat> so they entered faith, but it did not last. They are also like the ones described by Allah. Again, we're talking about those who became Muslim, um, but but their Islam didn't last. Here's an example. Uh, when they claim that they were believers, uh, the Bedouins say we have believed. Um, say, meaning respond to them, Muhammad Wasallam, you have not yet believed, but say instead, we have submitted, aslamna, we surrendered, for faith has not entered your hearts, not yet, anyway. 
So if faith truly entered the heart of a person with proper tranquility, then by Allah's will it will not leave his heart. That is why when Heraclius asked Abu Sufyan about those who entered Islam, did any of them leave his religion? You know, Abu Sufyan, uh, Heraclius, uh, the emperor of the Byzantines, of the Romans, uh, Abu Sufyan uh, was, was traveling and then he met up with Heraclius and there was a, a translator between the two, an interpreter. And Heraclius asked Abu Sufyan when he was a, not when he was a kafir before, because he became Muslim later on, obviously. But when he was a kafir, Heraclius asked him all these questions. One of them is that, did these people leave Islam who entered it? So Abu Sufyan said no. And then uh, it was said that when, when this faith is planted in the heart of, you know, of, of a person, it does not exit it. And in fact, Heraclius is the one that, that said this and acknowledged what Abu Sufyan said. But faith which is fragile, which did not settle in the heart, this is what should be feared. The Quran shows eloquence and clarity again when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using analogies of perceived things so you can better understand concepts of belief and disbelief. Allah is talking about a fire being kindled, He's talking about a storm with rain and so on and darkness. These are things that we can see and perceive. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using that to show us the concepts of belief and disbelief. And again, this is a proof, as Shaykh Uthameen said, of affirming the use of qiyas in, in fiqh, in jurisprudence, because every analogy in the Quran, every parable in the Quran is actually a proof for qiyas because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses that. We also see that the greater the darkness, the more fear one has of them. The darkness, as I mean, as we saw in verse 19, or it is like a rainstorm from the sky within which is darkness, thunder and lightning. They put their fingers in their ears against the thunderclaps in dread of death. Fear of thunder and lightning is a natural thing. Sound and light in general are not feared. People are not scared of sound and light, but the outcome of it, in this case, the shock and the fear that comes along with them in that you know, the, the lightning could take away their sight and that the sound of the thunderclaps could put terror in their hearts and actually kill them. When one hears thunder, um, at times he might be at ease because, you know, lightning is faster, so he didn't get struck by the lightning, and so that he might think that he is uh, safe. We observe the behavior of man and his greed for life, because he'll hold on to his life at any cost. That's why you find that they put their fingers in their ears and are willing to take the pain by putting their so far inside their ear to avoid what's even more painful, which is death. Now one can can ask the question, can this be used as a proof of a khafud dararain, right? The lesser of the two evils that people talk about in, in, in the sciences of fiqh and in, in Islam. <clears throat> and we say yes. Taking the lesser of the two evils is taken in matters of the sharia, but this is also a natural thing that people do, not just the sharia matter. But there's actually a better proof that Sheikh Hathameen presented about the lesser of the two evils with Khadr. You know, we read about Khadr in, in, in Surah Al-Kahf every week on Friday regarding the ship and how he tore it open in order to preserve it from being taken by the king. The king would take good ships by force. Otherwise, he wouldn't take them if they were damaged. So Khadr, he, he damaged the ship so that if the king came and saw it, he would leave it alone. So in this case, damaging some of it was done in order to preserve the whole. We also see Allah's threat to this believers that He is encompassing of them as we read in the end of verse 19. Wallahu mahitum bil kafirin. There's no escape. In verse 20, we read that lightning can turn one blind and thunderclaps can make one deaf and it can even terrorize somebody and kill them from the shock. We also see that same people take advantage of opportunities. That is why these hypocrites, you know, the analogy was given that they move slowly when there's a bit of lightning. And they, they, they also avoid what is detrimental. That is why when it is dark, they just stop right away. We also see affirmation of Allah's will in verse 20. It says, And if Allah had willed, He could have taken away their hearing and their sight. And from this, we can see the benefits and the bounties of hearing and sight. In the hadith presented below, the Prophet ﷺ uh, taught us uh, a beautiful supplication, part of which is, Allahumma matana bi asma'ina wa absarina. وَقُوَّتِنَا مَا أَحْيَيْتَنَا O Allah, let us enjoy our hearing, our sight, and our power as long as you keep us alive. Never take these things for granted. We also see the affirmation of Allah's name, Al-Qadir, the Ever-Capable. This, is, this shows the generality of Allah's power over all things, that He's over all things competent. Allah is able to create out of nothing and also able to remove anything from existence, make it perish, make it you know, non-existent. He is able to change a good person into a corrupt person and vice versa. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the next verse, Ya ayyuhannas, u'abudu rabbakum, 
فعبدوا ربكم الذي خلقكم والذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون. Oh my kind, worship your Lord who created you and those before you that you may become righteous. So now the address is to all of mankind. Ya ayyuhan nas. Even though the surah, surah al-Baqarah, that was, re- it was revealed as a, as a madani, madani surah. Um, in such surah or such chapters, the address is primarily to the believers. Like usually when you, you read uh, surah which were, which were revealed after the migration, after the hijrah, not necessarily physically in Mecca or Medina per se, but after the hijrah itself, uh, this, this is what we say that these are madani surah. The Madani Surah are primarily to the believers because they come with legislation and things like that that have to do with the Muslims, the believers. Uh, whereas normally the address to all people is for the Surah which were built in Mecca because this is about calling to Islam and calling to the Tawheed of Allah. Uh, but, but this is the first verse in which there's an address. Ya ayyuhan nas. And due to that it was an address to everybody. This is the same as Allah's statement. Qul ya ayyuhan nasu inni rasulullah ilaykum jami'a. That is say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. O mankind, indeed, I am the messenger of Allah to all, to you all. Right? One may say that the verse itself is Meccan, but was part of a Madani chapter. But the origin is that it is not that way. This is why in some prints of the Noble Quran, you might see that it says this chapter is Meccan, except for, for verse this and verse that, which is Madani and vice versa. And Shaykh al said this cannot be stated unless there's a clear evidence for it. If a chapter is Madani, meaning it was revealed after the Hijrah, from Mecca to Medina, then we say that all of its verses are Madani, and the same goes for the Meccan chapters that were revealed before the migration. In this verse that we just read, um, is that affirmation of, man, of maintaining the unity of Allah's divinity and the unity of Allah's lordship. We see both. <clears throat> the unity of Allah's divinity, or Tawheed al comes from U'budu, and it is called as such because it is directed to Allah. This ibadah or worship means to humble oneself to Allah. at lillah. Complete humility and requiring love and reverence at the same time. Dhullan tamman kamilan mustazman al mahabbati wa ta'zim. The love of Allah is manifested by obedience to Allah's commands so that the slave reaches his beloved. If you love someone, you obey them. The reverence of Allah is manifested by avoiding the prohibitions so that one's Lord, the Most Great, Al Azim, does not punish him. So you love Allah. You, you are yearning for his reward, yearning for him, but at the same, and this is, this is the, the mahabba, the love. You, love. you love Allah, you obey his commands, and you revere Allah, that he is the Azim, Al Azim, the most great, and you fear his punishment because he is Al Azim, and he is able to do that with you as a slave. So, This ibadah, worship, is explained as such when it comes to the actions of the slave. It can also, so we're talking about ibadah, meaning generally speaking. It can also be explained in terms of the act of worship itself. So we talk about salah, prayer, zakah, almsgiving, fasting, siyam, hajj, pilgrimage. All, all of these are acts of worship. Ibn Taymiyyah explained it in a comprehensive way saying, Al-ibadatu ismun jami'un li kulli ma yuhibbuhu Allah wa yardahu min al-aqwali wal a'mali al-batinati wa al-zahira. Ibadah, worship, is an all-encompassing noun for all of what Allah loves and is pleased with in terms of saying, Sayings and actions, both hidden and apparent. So sayings and actions, uh, both hidden and apparent. So it covers both at-ta'abbudu wal muta'abbudu bih. So worship itself and the acts of worship uh, in particular. Um, in this verse, it seems that both meanings are intended. So we're talking about the act of worship itself and the one who's worshipping. And they both are obviously, you can see, connected with each other. Now in this verse it says, O mankind, worship your Lord who created you and those before you that you may become righteous. Your Lord, Ar-Rabb, Rabbukum. The Rabb is the creator of uh, basically Al-Khaliq, Al-Malik, the owner, Al-Mudabbir, the disposer of all affairs. So he created everything from, from nothing, he owns it all, and he disposes of its affairs and basically takes care of everything. Creation means making something exist from nothing. This is only for Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَنْ يَخْلُقُ دُبَابًا وَلَوْ اجْتَمَعُوا لَهُ As a challenge. Those who call other than Allah will never create as much as a fly even if they gather together for that purpose. We're not talking about cloning cloning a plant or cloning an animal. or No, no. We're talking about creating it from completely from scratch, from nothing. Allah also says that He created those before us. That is why we see generations passing in different ages, age groups and people coming after others. Those who came before us are created and we are from their progeny. Allah says regarding 
uh, this regarding Nuh alayhi salam, وَجَعَلْنَا ذُرِّيَتَّهُ هُمُ الْبَاقِينَ And we made his descendants those remaining on earth. So whatever came from what is created must also be created. So if I came from my parents who created, then I must be created as well. And then Allah says, that you may become righteous. In order to reach a taqwa, which is a high status, as Allah says about paradise, that it has been prepared for the righteous. Al-Muttaqoon. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفَرَةِ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُ وَالسَّمَوَاتُ وَعَرْضُ وَعِدَّةِ الْمُتَّقِينَ And hasten to forgiveness from your Lord and a garden as wide as the heavens and the earth prepared for the righteous. This is about those who are muttaqoon. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Nahl, إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْا وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ مُحْسِنُونَ Allah indeed is with those who fear Him and those who are doers of good. He also says in parts of three verses of the Qur'an, وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَ الْمُتَّقِينَ And know that Allah is with those who will fear Him. <clears throat> in verse 22, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الذي جعل لكم ضا فراشا والسماء بناء وأنزل من السماء ماء فأخرج به من الثمرات رزق لكم فلا تجعلوا لله أندادا وأنتم تعلمون He who made for you the earth a bed spread out and the sky a ceiling and sent down from the sky rain and brought forth thereby fruits as provision for you So do not attribute to Allah equals while you know that there is nothing similar to Him This shows a number of Allah's actions Al-Af'al The earth is a bed, a place of settlement and comfort. A bed is flat and comfortable. Allah made the sky as a canopy, well guarded. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, shidada. This is in Surah An-Naba. And constructed above you seven strong heavens. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the heavens, sama And we made the sky a protected ceiling, but they from its signs are turning away. So when Allah says that He sent down rain from the sky, I have that in red for you, it does not mean that the sky itself rains. Because the word sama also means ulu, altitude. And rain comes from the clouds. How do we know this? Uh, from the revelation, obviously, before anybody figured it out with science. Allah says, أَلَمْ تَرَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ يُزْجِي سَحَابًا ثُمَّ يُؤَلِّفُ بَيْنَهُ ثُمَّ يَجْعَلُهُ رُكَامًا فَتَرَ الْوَدْقَ يَخْرُجُ مِنْ خِلَالِهِ Do you not see that Allah drives clouds, then He brings them together, then He makes them into a mass, and you see the rain emerge from within? So Allah here explains clearly that it comes from the clouds. So the rain does not come down from the sky itself, which is the structure of the canopy. Rather, it comes down from the clouds, which are on an altitude in the sky. So the word sama has two meanings, the canopy and the altitude. The many people, they confuse this and think, oh, sama, sama, it means sky, means heavens. No, it means altitude, it means, it means ulu as well. This is very important for aqidah matters as well, matters of creed. And then Allah says, And brought forth thereby fruits as provision for you. So Allah brought forth there with fruits, meaning with the rain as the cause. So Allah attributed this to Himself, but with the cause, the sabab, but the cause only leads to it. It does not bring out the fruits. Allah brings them out therewith. The one who does this is Allah because the cause is the rain. Allah mentions fruits in the plural due to the great variety that comes from the same water. Then Allah says in what translates his meaning, They do not set up rivals unto Allah and worship while you know that He alone has the right to be worshipped. So you are not to set up rivals unto Allah and worship while you know that there are no rivals to Allah in terms of creating, sustenance, bringing down the rain and so on of the actions of Lordship. Related to this, the mushrikun acknowledge that Allah is the creator, the sustainer, the disposer of all affairs and they know there is no God with Allah in this respect. They know Allah is the Rabb. This is a fact. But when it comes to worship, they deny making it only for Allah. They associate other gods with Allah, and they even criticize and censure those who single out Allah in worship. That's why in Surah Sa'd, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about them and what they say, Has He made the gods only one God? Indeed, this is a curious thing. Strange. Reality is that the mushrikun who came up with, are the ones who came up with a strange, curious thing. It is actually the Messenger of Allah وسلم, who came with what is correct. So they are not to make rivals to Allah while they know that Allah has no rivals in His Lordship, in His Rububiyya. This realization of the unity of Allah's Lordship necessitates that they single out Allah in worship. If they don't, then they are what? Contradicting themselves. Al-Ulama, the scholars have said, Tawheed al-Uluhiyya wa tadhamminun li Tawheed al-Rububiyya. Tawheed al-Uluhiyya includes Tawheed al-Rububiyya. 
وتوحيد الربوبية مستلزم لتوحيد الألوهية and توحيد الربوبية necessitates توحيد الألوهية so acknowledging lordship means one has to acknowledge divinity once you know that Allah is the Lord you have to acknowledge divinity and acknowledging divinity means you've already established that Allah is the Lord you've already acknowledged that this verse shows the importance of ibadah worship it has been ordained by a call يا أيها الناس O mankind it is the most important thing and the very purpose of creation Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَمَا خَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I did not create the jinn and mankind except to worship me this verse also shows the obligation of worship and it is proven by the intellect in addition to legislation because the verse says worship your Lord and the Lord is worthy of being worshipped and none other than none other than Allah the Lord is worthy the interesting thing about the mushrikun the, those who associate partners with Allah is that when they are in a state of desperation they have no one else to call and for, for help they will pray to Allah alone for help because their inherent nature drives them towards it this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Luqman and when a wave covers them like shades they invoke Allah, make, making their invocations for Him only. But when He brings them safe to land, there are among them those that stop in the middle between basically belief and disbelief, فَمِنُّ muqtasid, but none denies our signs except very uh, perfidious, ungrateful people, right? People who are, have no, are not grateful to Allah. So, <clears throat> this verse also affirms that only Allah is the creator of all. Those who came before and those who will come on or who will come later on. We also see that from this verse, in general, the Noble Quran gives the reason of her ruling. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he says something, most of the time he gives the reason for it. The ruling here is to worship Allah and the reason is what? Is that He is the Lord who created us and those before us. This verse also shows the high status of taqwa. Not everyone can reach this status except those who truly make all worship sincere to Allah or for Allah. This is why the command is to worship Allah so that one attains taqwa, right? Worship your Lord so that you may attain taqwa. One can extrapolate from this verse a warning from bid'ah, innovations in the religion, and that is because worshiping Allah cannot be done except in a way that He has legislated. One cannot know about ablution, wudu, prayer, and so on without divine revelation. This verse also encourages acquiring knowledge because you have to know how to worship Allah. One cannot worship Allah without knowledge. That is why you find the likes of Imam al-Bukhari, including a chapter in his hadith compilation titled Bab al-Ilmi Qabla al-Qawli wal-Amal, meaning chapter it is essential to know a thing first before saying or acting upon it. We also see Allah's mercy and wisdom in how he made the earth a bed as opposed to it being all rough and solid. It's not a rough terrain, right? We also see how Allah made the sky a canopy. We see in this Allah's power and competence. Also how Allah brings the rain down from the sky, you know, via the clouds as we explain. If all the creation gathered to create one drop of water, they would not be able to do so. And a hadith is presented below in which the Prophet ﷺ was asked to call Allah uh, for rain because it was it was very dry. He said, والسلام, Allahumma ghithna, Allahumma ghithna. Oh Allah, send down rain upon us. Oh Allah, send down rain upon us. We also see Allah's wisdom and mercy in bringing the rain down from the sky as opposed to the water just running on the earth. Had it been the latter, if it was just running on the earth, this would have harmed people and many landscapes would have been de deprived. Uh, imagine who uh, people at, at high you know, parts of the earth like mountains and so on, if the water was running, it would not reach up there. The rain also comes down as drops, very gentle for the most part. It is not poured down because that would also harm people. People take these things for granted. This verse also affirms the causes because Allah described it as so, yet the causes are only so by the will of Allah. Because Allah says, and brought forth thereby fruits as provision for you. Allah is the one that brought out the fruits using this cause which is rain, but ultimately it's Allah. It is appropriate to achieve everything to Allah coupled by the cause. This is why in this verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he brought the fruits with, uh, with, the, with the rain. For example, if someone was saved from drowning, he can say that Allah saved him with so-and-so person. One may say that so-and-so saved him. You can say that. One can say that Allah saved him then so-and-so. But one should not say that Allah saved him and so-and-so. Then now you're, you're associating partners with Allah. So, for example, this hadith here about the young Jew who became ill and he was on his deathbed. And the Prophet Sallallahu went to call him to Islam. Uh, this uh, young, uh, young Jew looked at his father as if to ask him for permission. 
And his father said to obey Abu al-Qasim, which is uh, Rasulullah Sallam's, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, laqab or, or kunya. So he accepted Islam, this Jew, and the Prophet Sallallahu stood up saying, Alhamdulillah, ladhi anqadahu bi min al-nar. Praise be to Allah who has saved him through me from hell. So he, he mentioned Allah and himself, but he attributed it back to Allah who used him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a means for that. One thing to note here is the strangeness of the uh, young Jew's father who did not become a Muslim, even though he gave his son permission to become Muslim. We don't know what happened to his father. This narration doesn't say anything and there are no other narrations that uh, tell the fate of that uh, father of the Jew. We also see Allah's power, competence in bringing down the rain and his favor in bringing out the fruits from the earth. His favor on man, whether believer or, or disbeliever. Allah addressed all of mankind in this verse, Ya ayyuhan nas. But Allah's favor on the believer is continuous because it is in this life and in the hereafter. But the disbelievers ends when this life ends in this world and then the hereafter he will have nothing. The verse also shows the prohibition of making rivals to Allah due to his saying, so do not attribute to Allah equals while you know. If one makes a rival unto Allah in worship, meaning one worships others like he worships Allah, this is major shirk. If one makes a rival unto Allah in lordship in rububiyyah, such as saying that there are two creators, then this is also major shirk. Whatever is less, less than this, uh, uh, than these two is minor shirk, such as attributing something to Allah and the cause on an equal footing by using the letter in Arabic wow, which means and, immediately and. But if one believes that this cause has its own effect like that of Allah, then it becomes major shirk as well, uh, the cause being, in this case, independent of Allah. The verse also shows that when one addresses another, then he must present the clear convincing evidence, iqamat al hujjah that's what Allah does. When He tells people to worship Him alone, He tells them because He is their Lord who created them and those before them. And the verse also says that we are not to set up rivals unto Allah while we know and that He is our Lord, the only Lord, the only Creator. So Allah gave the reason for the ruling. And most of the time Allah gives the reason. There are some cases where Allah does not give the reason and that's part of the test to see if we will surrender or not. Uh, some people actually glorify and love the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam if we're talking about shirk here as much as or even more than Allah. That's also major shirk we should be careful of. It should be known that the reason why we love and glorify the Messenger وسلم, is because he وسلم, is Allah's Messenger. Next Allah says, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِنْ مِثْلِهِ وَدْعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ And if you're in doubt about what we have sent down upon our servant Muhammad وسلم, then produce a surah like the, the like thereof and call upon your witnesses other than Allah if you should be truthful. So in this verse is an address that, the, that those same people who set up rivals with Allah as in the previous verse. So in the previous verse, uh, we were talking about the Tawheed of Allah, Tawheed al-Qasd, when Allah told them, do not make rivals with me. And this one here is about Tawheed al-Ittiba' the Tawheed of following only the Messenger of Allah وسلم, because Allah is talking about His servant, Muhammad وسلم, in that He brought this Qur'an to them and they have to obey him as well and they have to follow him and many times we feel that we read in the Quran wa Allah, wa Rasul, obey Allah and obey his messenger وسلم. so these two come hand in hand together in many places now the word raib is used again in the Arabic language it means a doubt that is accompanied by anxiety and worry that is because what the messenger وسلم, came with is the truth and thus he uh, meaning the doubter of it will also feel uneasiness because he knows that he must believe and so this keeps bothering him, keeps making him anxious. Otherwise, if it was something else other than this, then, then he would just have doubts and move on and he doesn't really care. Allah says about what we have sent down upon our messenger, ala abdina. This is the Qur'an, what was revealed down is the Qur'an. And our servant here is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah describes Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as his messenger in terms of a high status of servitude. It's actually an honor to be called abdina in this case for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah described him as our servant, Abdina, when defending him, as in this verse that we're looking at here. When Allah honored him with al Isra wal Mi'raj, and when honoring him with the revelation of the Quran, we see in the verse on the right side there, exalted as he who was, took his servant by, by night from Masjid al Haram to Masjid al Aqsa, whose surroundings we have blessed to show him of our signs. Indeed, he is the hearing, the seeing. And then we also uh, when 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 uh, you know talking about the Quran being revealed to him, alayhi salatu wassalam. Blessed is he who sent down the criterion upon his servant that he may be uh, to the worlds a warner. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defends Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in general as, was, as we see here in verse 23 in Surah Al-Baqarah. We see him talking about him as our servant there, our servant also when it comes to the Isra and the Mi'raj, the uh, night journey and the ascension, and also defending him as far as the revelation of the Qur'an that came down to him. The best descriptions of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are Ubudiyya and Risala. That is what? Servitude and the message. The best description is given in this hadith. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, here, do not extol me, do not over glorify me as the Christians extolled Isa, the son of Maryam. I am merely a servant, so say he is Allah's servant and his messenger. Servitude, which is humility to the one being worshipped and revered, is something that is enjoyed by the worshipper. This is something that people are deprived of if they don't know the taste of it. Allah challenges them to produce a surah, the like thereof. This is the challenge. In this verse, when it says, Min mithlihi, it translates as, as the like thereof. It can either mean like the Quran or to come up with something like it from another human like the Messenger وسلم, to come up with something like the Quran. So in the here it could mean like the Quran or like someone like the Messenger وسلم, to come up with the Quran. So bring me a, a, something like the Quran the scripture itself and or bring me someone like Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who can come up with the Quran like the one. Both meanings are correct because no human can come up with anything similar to the, mes the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam brought. Allah says in Surah Al-Isra, say if mankind and the jinn gathered in order to produce the like of this Qur'an, they could not produce the like of it even if they were to each other assistance. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues and says, and call upon your witnesses other than Allah, meaning those on whom you witness that they are gods besides Allah. Or those, who, those that you witness they are gods besides Allah, call them. Those that you worship like you worship Allah. Let them come and assist you. This is a big challenge to both the worshipper and the worship. And they cannot do it. They cannot do it. Allah then warns them. فَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا وَلَنْ تَفْعَلُوا فَاتَّقُوا النَّارَ الَّتِي وَخُدُوا نَسُوا الْحِجَارَةِ وَعِدَّةِ الْكَافِرِينَ But if you do not, and you will never be able to, then fear the fire whose fuel is men and stones, prepared for the disbelievers. So Allah tells them not to even try. The fire is the outcome of their inability, and the only way for them to save themselves from the fire is to believe in what was brought by the Messenger The fire is fueled by, by people and stones, as we see in this verse. The fire burns them and uses them as fuel. As for the stones, then this is in reference to the stones of the fire and to their stone idols as well, and both are correct. The fire has been prepared for the disbelievers, all of them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّكُمْ وَمَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ حَصَبُوا جَهَنَّمَ أَنْتُمْ لَهَا وَارِدُونَ Indeed, you disbelievers and what you worship other than Allah are the firewood of hell. You will be coming to enter it. So the stones are the stones that light up the fire and also the idols are in there with the ones who worship the idols. In verse 23 that we just read before this one, Allah defends His Messenger وسلم, by charging the disbelievers to come up with as chapter like the Quran and Allah honors him وسلم, by calling him our servant as we saw. Servitude to Allah is the utmost of freedom because if one does not worship Allah, then he will have to undoubtedly worship other than Allah. Um, if he doesn't worship Allah, who is the only one worthy of worship, then he'll worship the shaitan, the devil, and his own desires. Verse 23 shows that the Quran is the speech of Allah because Allah says, zalna, That is, about what we have sent down. The Quran is speech, and speech is not created a created body by itself that is separate from Allah. It is an attribute of the one who speaks. Wasful mutakallim, as we say in Arabic. Those who claim that the Quran is created attempt to prove their false claim. They use verses in the Quran. For example, they say that Allah speaks about, you know, uh, bringing down iron, or the one in which Allah speaks about sending down eight pairs of cattle, or the one in which He made the darknesses and light. They use these terms that say the Quran was made into Arabic and so on. This is no evidence actually, this is actually evidence against them, and that is because there's a difference between created things which are independent that Allah attributes to Himself, that they belong to Allah, and then attributes which are not separate from Allah, that they've always been with Him. The sifat of Allah are with Him. Verse 23 proves Allah's transcendence, Allah. That is because the Qur'an is a speech and it has been sent down, revealed from Him. This, is, this necessitates that the transcendence of the one who speaks it comes from above. Allah's ulu, transcendence, is also established by man's natural disposition and intellect. There are five proofs for Allah's ulu, the Qur'an, the Sunnah, al ijma consensus, Al-Aql, the intellect, and the Fitrah, the, the natural disposition of human beings. Regarding servitude, 
al Allah describes everyone, believers and disbelievers, to be his slaves. We know this. Yet, he described the Messenger وسلم, as Abdina, our servant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Maryam, In kullu man fi samawati uladhi illa ati rahmani abda. There is no one in the heavens and earth but that he comes to the most merciful as a servant. So how could we have everyone being described as a servant and then Muhammad وسلم, as a servant? The answer to this is that servitude has many meanings. It's different levels. There is the general universal type of servitude and this includes everyone and nobody has any choice but to be a slave of Allah. The kafar, the disbeliever, the sinner, the fasiq, all of them are slaves of Allah in that Allah can do whatever He wants with them because He is the Lord, they are His slaves. As for the specific type of servitude, then this is one of obedience, ta, and it is for one who believes in Allah and follows the sharia. This is a kind of specific one. Even the specific type of servitude can be categorized into more general and more specific. The servitude of the Prophet ﷺ is not the same as that of the steadfast affirmers of truth and as siddiqina wa shuhada wa salihin, the martyrs and the righteous. Every level of ubudiyah is different. The verse also shows that the Quran is inevitable even if it is if it is uh, with one short chapter. The challenge is, is even with one sentence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says bi hadith mithli in Surah Al-Tur. And here we go, we've seen this before in Surah Al-Fatiha and we talked about that tafsir. Allah has mentioned the superiority of the Noble Qur'an in four aspects. It is inimitable, a challenge. So in this verse here, in Surah Al-Isra, say if mankind and the jinn gathered in order to produce the like of this Qur'an, they could not produce the like of even if it were, even if they were to each other assistance. So this is the, you know, bring, the, bring something like the whole thing, the entirety of it. Or ten chapters, as we see in Surah Hud. Or do they say he meant that it? Say then bring ten surahs like it that have been invented and called upon for assistance, whomever you can, besides Allah, if you should be truthful. It even goes down to just one chapter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surat, um, in, in the second chapter, in Surah Al-Baqarah, that we're just reading right now, when كُنْتُمْ فِي رَبِّ مِمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِثْلِهِ Come up with one chapter like it. And also, even a short sentence in Surah Al-Tur that we just saw in the previous slide, part of it. Or do they say he has made it up, rather they do not believe, then let them produce a statement like it if they should be truthful. So the challenge is on. Verse 23 also shows that the challenge is both to the worshippers and the worshipped, and call upon your witnesses other than Allah. This is more severe and humiliating than if the worshippers were challenged alone. Verse 24 that we're looking at now shows that nobody can challenge Allah's speech, and Allah says, and you will never be able to. The Arabic cannot be used to prove that the disbelievers have been averted from doing what they were able to do meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them not think about it even though they can do it no no it wasn't like that the Quran cannot be imitated it means that their nature um, as human beings is incapable of doing so and this understanding about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala averting them from doing it <clears throat> making them distracted is actually wrong because this does not show that the Quran is a miracle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes is inimitable the Quran is the speech of Allah, and speech is an attribute of the speaker. So just as human beings cannot be like Allah in his attributes, similarly they cannot be like Allah in his speech. That is impossible. That is why those who claimed to be prophets and came up with their own Quran ended up being a masquerade. They were a source of mockery, just as what has been mentioned about Musaylim the liar, al kadhab and others like him. So just as human beings cannot be like Allah in terms of knowledge, sight, hearing, and so on, they also cannot be like Allah in speech. The verse also shows that the fate of anyone who wants to go against the Qur'an is the hellfire. A fire which is fueled by people, just as fire is fueled with firewood, it burns them and is fueled by them. Two types of torment. The humiliation on them is also by putting them and their idols in the hellfire with them, and the idols being used as fuel for the very same fire that burns them. Now it is known that someone who have a, has a sort of jealousy for a deity or something that they love so much that is worshipped, does not want to see this thing being harmed, so the, the humiliation and the pain is multiplied in that respect. The verse shows that the fire exists now because Allah said that He prepared it in the past. U'iddat in Arabic it says. This is also proven in the Sunnah. The Messenger وسلم, was made to see the hellfire and its inhabitants being punished in it, such as Amr ibn al Hay al Khuza'i, who was dragging his intestines in the hellfire, or the woman who confined a cat until it died of hunger. And the man with the crooked stick, which he would use to steal from pilgrims. And you can see the, the two narrations at the bottom there. The first one is about uh, Amr ibn Luhay. Um, and the other and, and the other one uh, is about the other two that I mentioned now, the long hadith. Question that comes up sometimes. People ask this question because of things they've read here and there. Is Jahannam, is hellfire eternal or does it become non-existence? 
non-existent, does it perish? Uh, some scholars have declared an ijma, a consensus from the Salaf, that it is eternal and doesn't end. And some of them went against the Salaf by claiming that it will eventually become non-existence, but what is correct is that it will remain for eternity. And there's proof in the Quran for this, very clear proof. We have Surah An-Nisa, uh, chapter 4, verses 160 and 169. Indeed, those who disbelieve and commit wrong, never will Allah forgive them, nor will He guide them to a path. Except the path of hell, they will abide therein forever. Right? Forever. خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا أَبَدًا وَكَانَ ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ يَسِيرًا And that for Allah is always easier. So, خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا أَبَدًا Surah Al-Ahzab Indeed, Allah has cursed the disbelievers and prepared for them a blaze. Abiding therein, what? Forever. خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا أَبَدًا لَا يَجْدُونَ وَلِيًا وَلَا نَصِيرًا They will not find a protector or a helper. And also, in Surah Al-Jinn, Allah says, وَمَنْ يَصِلْ لَهُ وَرَسُولَهُ فَإِنَّ لَهُ نَرَجْ they will abide therein forever. So the Quran is very clear that they will abide therein forever. And after this, there's no evidence required. In his book, Shifa al-Ali, Ibn al-Qayyim, argued for the eventual non-existence of the hellfire, which is a strange position for somebody of his stature. Shaykh Abdul Rahman al-Sa'di, in his commentary on the book, Shifa al-Ali, by Ibn al-Qayyim, made this observation and used the Arab proverb, لِكُلِّ جَوَادٍ كَبْوَةٍ which means that every stallion has a slip. No matter how good the stallion is, the horse is, it will slip at some point. And it's not perfect. Also, لكل صارم نبوة, which means that every sharp sword at some point will fail to cut. So Ibn Qayyim is a great scholar. We respect him. We love him. He's from Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. But he can make mistakes too. So what is correct without any doubt is that hellfire will remain for eternity. This is because the, dis the disbeliever will remain there for eternity. Then that means that the hellfire has to be eternal. As for Allah saying, in Surah Hud, they will dwell therein for all the time that the heavens and the earth endure, except as your Lord wills, then this is applicable for the people of the hellfire, just as it is applicable for the people of paradise. If you look at the verses on the right side of the screen, uh, as for those who were destined to be wretched, they will be in the fire for them therein is violent exhaling and inhaling. They will be abiding therein as long as the heavens and the earth endure, except what your Lord should will. Indeed, your Lord is an effector of what He intends. But then Allah says in the next verse about the people of paradise, the exact same thing. And, 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 and as for those who were destined to be prosperous, they will be in paradise, abiding therein, again, as long as the heavens and the earth endure, except what your Lord should will. So Allah says in, in both, in both uh, parts of the verses, uh, It's the same thing for both. So both are eternal, right? So as we can see here, uh, because the reward and bounties of the people of paradise is from Allah's grace and favor, Allah has shown that it is something that does not stop. So He said, a gift without an end. Ata'an ghayra majdud, because it's from Allah's favors. And because the torment of the people of the hellfire is from Allah's justice and unrestricted authority, He said at the end of that verse, Verily, your Lord is the doer of what He wills. He does whatever He wants. Inna rabbaka fa'alun lima yurid. Right? This does not mean that Allah will take them out of the hellfire or will make the hellfire perish. That doesn't mean that. It means that they will dwell therein for all the time that the heavens and the earth endure except as Allah wills. In the sense that Allah has unrestricted authority as sultatul kamila to do whatever He wills. So the same terminology is being used in both verses talking about those who are in hellfire, those in paradise. So the Quran itself proves again that they will be in hellfire forever. And verse 24 shows that the hellfire is an abode for the disbelievers because Allah says about it that it has been prepared for them. As for the sinners among the believers, then they, will, they don't remain therein forever. They are like visitors who stay for, for a while. They'll be punished for sins which were not forgiven until Allah wills for them to get out of the hellfire either by intercession, by Allah's permission, that Allah allows someone to intercede for them, whether it's the prophets or the righteous, or by Allah's favor and grace. Someone may ask, how is the Qur'an a miracle? One can also say that Allah has quoted prophets, disbelievers, and others. So is their dialogue a miracle? So for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah al-Shu'ara about Fir'aun, قَالَ لَإِنَ اتَّخَدْتَ إِلَهًا غَيْرِهِ لَأَجْعَلَنَكَ مِنَ الْمَسْجُنِينَ Pharaoh said, if you take a God other than me, I will surely place you among those imprisoned. So is, is that a miracle? Is the statement of the Pharaoh a miracle? The answer is that the approach or the style, al-uslub, eloquence, al-balagha, Articulation al fasaha of the Qur'an is inimitable. Also, one does not get bored from reciting the Qur'an. Every time one recites it, he will find something new. And this is for the one who truly ponders it. And the way Allah presents it, and how the verses rhyme, and they're so balanced, the, the whole thing, I mean, is a miracle on its own. Verse 25 now. 
وبشر الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات ان لهم جنات تجري من تحتها الانهار كلما رزقوا منها من ثمره رزقا قالوا هذا الذي رزقنا من قبل واتوا به متشابها ولهم فيها ازواج مطهره وهم فيها خالدون and give good tidings to those who believe and do righteous deeds that they will have gardens in paradise beneath which rivers flow whenever they are provided with a provision of fruit therefrom they will say this is what we were provided with before and it is given to them in likeness and they will have their own purified spouses and they will abide therein eternally this verse is an address to the believers and is promised to them Allah's promise to them and it comes after verse 24 in which is a threat for the disbelievers who belied the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam the word bashir is used and the, and the related word in Arabic, bishara, is to inform about something that is pleasing. It was called as such because of the change of the color of the bashara, skin, of the one being addressed due to the happiness. So one's face, you know, lights up when they're told about something that makes them happy. The same word can be used to inform of something bad, however. Either way, either as a way of mocking them or because their skin changes as a reaction, just like those who are given glad tidings of what is good. So, you know, their skin changes because of bad news. But the first interpretation is closer and better uh, because they do not believe in what they're being told of the punishment anyway. So uh, why would their skin? It's about it's about uh, mocking them. It's about you know you know mocking them the way they mock uh, the believers. So they do not, they do not believe, and thus it is a way of ridiculing them. That's why Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "For bashirun bi'adabin alim." So give them glad tidings of a or tidings of a painful punishment. And then in another verse uh, in the Quran, two verses, it says in Surah Al-Dukhan. Uh, then pour over his head from the torment of scalding water, it will be said, taste indeed, you are the honored, the noble. So that one who said, I am honored, I am noble, how can Allah punish me? He will be told this as a, as a way of, of, of mocking, as a way of mocking him, the way he tried to mock the truth. So uh, this is the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the term bashir, or uh, and again it comes from bishara and bashara, which is the skin. The one being told to give the believers the glad tidings is either the Messenger وسلم, or to anyone who recites this address, meaning give glad tidings to the believers, O you who is being addressed, the address is to the believers who have these attributes to give them the good news. Those are the believers who believe in all of what Allah has and His Messenger وسلم, have brought, the six pillars of faith, belief in the matters, in such matters, not just mere tasdiq or acceptance, it is actually qubul, accepting the truth of it, and idhan, that is, submission, surrender. So you you believe it, you accept it as the truth, and you submit and surrender to it. As for and do righteous deeds, then it is the outcome of faith. Good deeds are built upon two foundations. They have to be sincere for Allah, and they have to be in accordance with the Sunnah. As for and do righteous deeds, as we said, it has to be in accordance with the Sunnah. And, and you know, the first proof about it being sincere to Allah, any action that is devoid of sincerity is not accepted. The Prophet Sallallahu said, قال الله تعالى, he quoted Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala as saying, أنا أغنى الشركاء عن الشرك فمن عمل عملا أشرك فيه معي غيري تركته وشركه. Right? So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, I am the one who is most free from want of partners. He who does a thing for the sake of someone else besides me or beside me, I discard him and his shirk, his polytheism. And as far as following the Sunnah, the Prophet Sallallahu says, he who does something contrary to our way, that is meaning Islam, the way he, he taught it, will be rejected, will have it rejected. And we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, you know, when he gives the, the, the glad tidings, they will be given, they will have gardens in paradise beneath which rivers flow. Those gardens are the same as those in this world, only in terms of the name, description. But the reality is different. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and no soul knows what has been hidden for them of comfort for eyes as reward for what they used to do. And Allah, uh, the, the Prophet وسلم, uh, said, Allah, the exalted and glorious said, I have prepared for my pious servants which no eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard, and no human heart has ever perceived those bounties leaving apart, those bounties about which Allah has informed you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about مَا لَا عِنٌ رَعَتْ وَلَا أَدْنٌ سَمِعَتْ وَلَا خَطْرَ عَقَلِ بَشْرًا The scholars explain that the rivers are below the trees of paradise in the palaces, not under the paradise literally. It's about the, the, the palaces there, the trees, and the rivers are, are below. And the scholars explain that the rivers are below the trees. Such rivers come in four types. As we see in the verse on the right there in Surah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah created 
uh, them without bees. So you know we're talking about uh, uh, rivers of of, um, of 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 water, milk, wine, and 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 honey, and so on. So the bees, Allah did Allah created these without bees and cows and camels or grapes. The water does not come from rain or springs, right? All of this is created from Allah inherently without causes. And then Allah says, whenever they are provided with a provision of fruit therefrom, they will say, this is what we were provided with before, and it is given to them in likeness. They say this because what they are provided with resembles, in terms of the way it looks, the size, you know, the shape, and so on. But the reality is that when they taste it, it will be a different taste. So one feels great pleasure when he sees that it looks the same, yet there is a diversity of tastes. They are not all the same. And they will have their unpurified spouses. Whenever Allah mentions fruits, He mentions spouses. And, with, and that is because they will be enjoying it. The words in Arabic, فاكهة, which is fruits, and فاكهون, they're being amused. Both of them come from the word تفكه, which means amusement and enjoyment. So we see here, for example, in Surah Yaseen, إِنَّ أَصْحَابَ جَنَةِ الْيَمَ فِي شُغْلٍ فاكهون, فاكهون. Indeed, the companions of paradise that day will be amused in joyful occupation. They and their spouses in shade, reclining on a door couch. So the word tafakku, the, 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 the words that come from that are talking about the fruits and these spouses. And they will have their unpurified spouses. In Arabic, the word azwaj is used. This is the plural form of, of, of zawj. Uh, now, does this mean that everyone will have many spouses? The answer is yes. Azwaj is the plural of zawj. This term is given to both husband and wife. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in, in Surah An-Nisa is speaking about uh, inheritance, وَلَكُمْ نِصْفُ مَا تَرَكَ أَزْوَاجُكُمْ إِنْ لَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُنَّ وَلَدْ When Allah describes about أَزْوَاجُكُمْ, right? He's talking about, uh, and for you is half of what your wives leave if they have no child. So it's, it's used for the wife as well, the word أَزْوَاج. What if a woman dies young before she gets married? Will she have a husband in paradise? Yes. Either from the people of this world or from those whom Allah will create and enter into paradise because there will be some bounties remaining after all dwellers of paradise enter it. So Allah will create another creation and, and He will bring those into paradise. Purified spouses, they are purified both externally and internally. So there's no menstruation, urine, feces, both natal bleeding, sweat and so on. Uh, also pure from internal such as hate, resentment, bitterness and so on. But in this world the spouses are fit for men because we men also have impurities as well. But in the hereafter, everybody will be pure. And they will abide therein eternally, and there will be no end. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, When the dwellers of Jannah enter Jannah, an announcer will call, You have a promise from Allah that you will live therein, and you will never die. You will stay healthy therein, and you will never fall ill. You will stay young, and you will never become old. You will be under a constant bliss, and you will never feel miserable. Allahu Akbar. The highest bounty, though, is seeing Allah's face. As explained by the Messenger وسلم, when we see this, when he explained this verse in in in, um, in chapter ten, Surah Yunus, verse twenty six, when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُ الْحُسْنَى وَزِيَادَةً," for them who have done good is the best reward and extra. This ziyada, this extra, is seeing Allah's face. And verse twenty five shows the permissibility of giving glad tidings to make others happy, as we saw, al bishara. And we have, for example, in the Quran. When uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives, uh, you know, a good news to Ibrahim alayhi salam about Ishaq and about, uh, about Ismail in, in, the, in the chapter uh, As-Safat. And we gave him a, a good tidings of Isaac, a prophet from among the righteous. And then it says, so we gave him good tidings of a forbearing boy. This is talking about Ismail alayhi salam. So glad tidings, giving glad tidings of seasons of worship such as Ramadan to congratulate others upon its arrival. And after the fasting is done, like saying, may Allah accept from you and so on. This is or on Eid. This is the way of the Salaf. In verse 25, we see that paradise is only for those who have faith and good actions. Good actions include enjoining the truth and enjoining patience, as we know, sabr. We, we read that uh, a lot in the Quran. We also see that if one commits an evil action, they are not to be congratulated on it, nor given glad tidings of it. Um, in, in fact, we know that in this case, there's the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, uses that in, in terms of a mockery of those who do evil. But in the case of a mujtahid who makes a mistake, he will get one reward and he does not get a sin. However, if someone is not a mujtahid and goes in that realm or doesn't even give an effort, then there will be a sin. That's why we have uh, the hadith of Muhammad Wasallam. When a judge utilizes his skill of judgment and comes to a right decision, he will be, ha we will have a, he will be having a double reward. But if he uses his judgment and makes a mistake, he will get one single reward for his effort basically. 
The word of those who believe and do good deeds is much more than their actions, as we know. This is because no matter how much they do, their lifespan is limited, whereas the reward is eternal, and also their actions may be coupled with fatigue or laziness. It'll, it, they'll fall short, such that they become deficient. But Allah, but if Allah grants them his, 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 his minna, his favor, and enters them into paradise, then the bounties are complete. So, you know, Allah will overlook the shortcomings, and He will give them paradise, bi ta'ala. Uh, we also see that paradise is of different types because it has been mentioned in the plural in, in, as gardens. Elsewhere too in the Quran, we have in Surah Rahman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa rabbi jannatan. But for he who has feared the position of his Lord are two gardens. And then elsewhere it says, Wamin dunihima jannatan. And below them both in excellence are two other gardens. Right? And also and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says uh, in a hadith here in uh, in uh, Sahih al-Bukhari. There will be two paradises of silver and all the utensils and whatever is therein will be of silver and two paradises of gold and its utensils and whatever therein will be of gold and there will be nothing to prevent the people from seeing their Lord except the cover of majesty over his face in the paradise of Eden, eternal bliss. This verse also shows Allah's competence in creating the different rivers without the known causes in this world, water, wine, milk and honey. It has come in the narrations that these rivers run without being in ditches. Uh, Sheikh Hathameen was talking about this and I was amazed to hear that. Nothing was dug up for them. So they, they literally flow above the ground. A river runs and a man will do with it, with it whatever he wants. He will direct it any way he wishes. Ibn al-Qayyim said, Anharuha fi ghayri ukhdudin jarat, jarat subhana mumsikiha an al-fayadani. Meaning its rivers run without ditches. Exalted is the one who withholds it from flooding. Even though it's it's running above the earth or above the, 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 the land meaning. The people of paradise get similar foods but with varying tastes. The verse, is also, uh, the verse also affirms marriage in the hereafter, so intercourse there is real, but without the harmful matters of this world, so there's no semen or other fluids, as those were created for the human race to continue in this world. But in paradise there will be no need for that, because everyone will live forever. They will, not, they will also not need any, any like offspring or progeny to help them or you know, in their old age or whatever, or service, as they will be served by wildana mukhalladun, by young boys made eternal with cups and jugs and a glass from the flowing of wine or the flowing wine um, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes this further they will not need to climb uh, a tree for uh, to get their fruit uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Rahman they are reclining on beds whose linings are of silk uh, brocade and the fruit of the two gardens is hanging low scholars mention that a man would look at a fruit on a tree which he likes so the branch will come down close to him and he will take that fruit the people of paradise remain therein forever. Paradise will not become non-existence, nor will its inhabitants. The adherents of the Sunnah have come to a consensus on this. As for the people of philosophy, they claim that Allah's actions cannot continue for eternity, meaning He can't give eternal, uh, you know, um, um, you know, reward. Um, so that it has to stop because only Allah is eternal. They just are trapped in their own nonsense. The philosophers. So paradise has to end eventually, as they claim. They conclude that Allah does not begin nor end an action. Really, really strange uh, thing. And we will talk about this, inshallah, later on as well. Sheikh Hathameen elaborates further on this in the other classes. Some of them even said that paradise becomes non-existence along with its inhabitants while a man is raising a morsel of good, of food in his mouth, sorry, of food in his mouth. And so he remains in that state for eternity. So he's bringing it up like this and then everything will stop and it'll be like this, you know. Or they say that a man will be having intercourse with his spouse and then the time of annihilation comes, al fana And so he remains with her forever like this, basically, in that position. Uh, I from that kind of uh, kind of thinking. We also concluded that hellfire is also eternal and will not perish according to what is correct. We saw this in the Quran in three places. It is strange that one of the adherents of the Sunnah would say that hellfire will perish and Ibn al-Qayyim made a mistake. May Allah forgive him and have mercy on him because this is rejected by the clear verses in the Noble Quran. We will continue next time inshaAllah. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.